Well, I have uh, 5.30 on my clock. So with that, I would like to convene this meeting of the Board of Directors of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District for October 21st, 2021. Holly, would you like to take the roll, please? Sure, uh, excuse me, President Mayhood. Here. Vice President Henry. Here. Director Ackman. Here. Director Falls. Here. Director Smalley. I'm sorry, Mark, I didn't hear you. Okay. Well, not hearing you. Mark, we can't hear you. You don't look muted, but we can't hear you. One way media. Yeah, I, I have a kind of, well, I'll just let people know, I have kind of a wonky connection tonight, so I'm going to occasionally have to turn off my, um, the video part just to keep keep it in, but it, it's not because I'm leaving the room or anything or going to play with my dogs. It's just to try that, to keep it together. <laughs> that high-tech term wonky, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Are there any additions or deletions to the closed session agenda? Staff has none, Chair. Okay. Um, and let's see, do we have any oral communications from the public regarding items in a closed session? I don't see any attendees, so I suspect uh, that we don't have any. So seeing none, hearing uh, none, we will now uh, adjourn to closed session. I'll see you back in a few minutes. All right. Here she is. Okay, with that, it's 6.30. And so I would like to convene this meeting of the Board of Directors of San Lorenzo Valley Water District for October 21st, 2021, um, convening the open session. There is There are no um, actions to report out of closed session. Holly, can you call the roll call vote? President Mayhood. Here. Vice President Henry. Here. Director Ackman. Here. Director Falls. Here. And Director Smalley. Here. Okay. Are there any additions or deletions to the agenda? Rick? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, there are <laughs> apologies. Any additions or deletions to the agenda? There, there are none. Okay. Um, then uh, we come to that part of the meeting, which is for oral communications uh, from the public on any subject that lies within the purview of the district but is not on the agenda tonight. I see that we do have uh, two of our faithful attendees here. So I'll just see if um, either of you have a comment that you'd like to make right now. If you do, please raise your hand. Seeing none, um, I'll go ahead and go on to uh, director's reports. And here I would like to ask um, Bob Fultz, who's the uh, chair of the admin committee to just report out what the committee decided to do about the vacancy on the committee. Uh, given the timing, we will uh, hold it over while we uh, recruit next year's um, committee members, which I believe that process started either today, yesterday, or sometime soon. Holly can probably correct me. Okay. That, that's correct. I think it's uh, it, it's basically open now online, and there'll be advertisements going out uh, shortly, so to encourage people to apply, and for those people that are already uh, members to uh, that want to continue on next year, you'll need to reapply. Okay, um, that's all I had for director's reports. Um, so we'll go to the one item of old business, which is the boardroom location for hybrid meetings. Rick? Yeah, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, you know, as the board knows, the recent statewide legislation, AB uh, 361, amended the, the Brown Act thereby changed uh, how the agencies such as the district may conduct remote meetings. 
uh, during a, a declared a state of emergency through January 1, 2024. At the last October 7th, uh, 2021 meeting, the board adopted resolution 421-21-22, uh, proclaiming an ongoing state of local emergency and authorizing remote meetings uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. The board on several occasions has has emphasized the need to move ahead with both uh, be able to have in-person meetings as well as online meetings. The district has been investigating uh, a meeting location for hybrid meetings to conduct board and committee meetings uh, remotely, uh, either through Zoom or GoToMeeting or some other platform. We've looked at many, many locations. Uh, there should be an attachment uh, to my memo in the board packet. Staff has come to the conclusion that the best location for us to prepare for hybrid meetings would be the district's about property. I think it's located at 12788 Highway 9, commonly known as the Johnson Building, the barn looking building next to uh, Foster Freeze. Um, we have a location there. We have two offices that are not in use, and we can, you know, install the stationary as a equipment to hold uh, hybrid meetings. Um, and, you know, not only will we be able to use this for board meetings and committee meetings, but we'll also be able to use it for overall staff training, um, and, and which is, you know, greatly needed. We don't have a spot that we can even, you know, assemble all staff for training. So with that, um, staff's recommending that the board um, review this memo and uh, by motion direct the district manager to move ahead with preparing the, the Johnson building um, uh, for um, uh, hybrid meetings, looking at uh, starting what we could probably be completed. It, it's some cosmetic work, uh, maybe some paint and some carpet um, or vinyl and uh, the video equipment install, which is probably the most time consuming of the endeavors. Uh, we could probably be, be completed mostly uh, and ready to go uh, mid-January 2022. Um, with that, uh, I'll uh, turn this back over to the chair and answer any questions um, that I can. Also, we did take this uh, same item to uh, the uh, October 12th, 2021, uh, admin committee meeting and the admin committee meeting was very supportive of, of moving forward and voted uh, in favor of the Johnson building. And obviously Director Foltz is here who can report more if he wishes on the admin meeting. Thank you. Okay, uh, well with that, let's let's start the discussion um, with Bob Foltz since he's the chair of the admin committee. So Bob, if you wanna weigh in on this. Sure, um, in the meeting before that one, we had asked the, um, district manager and staff to basically do a comprehensive survey of all of the possible meeting locations in our service area. And um, they came back with a list that had some things on it that I didn't think of, um, but it was extremely comprehensive. Um, and when you went through all of the um, I guess what I call it uh, terms and conditions for the use of each one of those uh, facilities. There was something in them for each one that really made it not a good fit for what we're trying to do. Um, on a personal note, I was particularly disappointed in the fact that the new Felton Library just seems to not be a place where these kinds of meetings can be held very, um, very easily. Uh, which is too bad because it's such a great facility. And I, I think its function as a meeting room was one of the selling points. Um, so uh, we looked at, I mean, basically just had to read through the memo, which I, I don't know if it was in this board packet, but it certainly was in the admin uh, agenda. And uh, you just read through it and it was really clear that the only option was the, the Johnson building. So um, I, I think with some, re I. I've been in there before. I think with some minor refreshing, it'll it'll suit us very well for what we're trying to do. And I think the rooms are also big enough for us to accommodate the in-person uh, fairly easily as well. Okay, thank you. Holly, go ahead. I just wanted to mention that that um, the, the uh, paper that he, uh, Bob is talking about is on page 13 of the overall agenda, nine of nine on this item. Perfect. 
for some reason I didn't see it. I did. Yeah, I read it. It was kind of discouraging. <laughs> yeah, it's, as you it's said, it was dirty. extensive and discouraging. <laughs> yeah, uh, there it is. Yeah, it, it was just not a um, boy. It's just it, it was really actually really surprising too. I have to admit that um, that it, that it that there wasn't just an easier way to do things outside of um, and that facilities weren't already set up for this. But you know, it is what it is. Okay. Uh, let's go ahead. Lois, did you have anything, comment that you wanted to make on this? Sure. Uh, I've been to committee meetings at the Johnson building, and I, I believe it would be a great location. There's parking, um, and I actually, I approve of this. Okay. Mark? Um, after reviewing the memo that uh, Bob was referencing, uh, it's clear to me that the Johnson building is the uh, most attractive alternative for what we're able to uh, see in the rest of the valley. So, no, no questions. Okay. Uh, Jamie? I have my concerns because I know we are uh, long-term looking to um, potentially, you know, relocate to a better facility, but I don't see any other real alternatives for us at this point, and I know we've, we're we going to have to have something um, for meetings, so I am in support of it. Bob, did you want to add on yeah, to that? Just one additional thing. Um, I think parking there is adequate probably for most of the, of the board meetings, the committee meetings we would have. If we had a meeting that where we expected a much larger audience, there you know, people may have to uh, um, park in um, more distributed locations, let's put it that way, um, be, because the parking lot itself for the building is pretty limited. There is some parking back and behind it, also on the streets, and then, of course, you know, on Highway 9 up and down the uh, um, street elsewhere. So, but, yeah, it is, uh, it, it will handle most of our board meetings very well. Rick, go ahead. You know, I just want to say I, I, I really do agree with, strongly agree with Jamie that, you know, this isn't the perfect solution right now, but it will get us through, you know, the pandemic in, in the next three years, uh, give us some time to, uh, to, to figure out what we're doing long range with that building. Um, you know, the library is struggling, in my opinion, coming back from the pandemic. They hope someday to get to where, you know, that Director Pulse has, has talked about. And then the last thing is that I think we ought to come back and maybe rename that building or call it something other than the Johnson building to be a little more, you know, not one person's name who we purchased it from. That, that was just a slang name. And you know how once it is, once you attach some, a name to something, very difficult to change. But I think we ought to think about it and bring it back to the board for a name change. Yeah, Mike and Rob. <laughs> yeah, that's good people. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That 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 seems logical. I I I shared the same concern as Jamie of just kind of hating to have to invest money in something that may ultimately be um, changed out or whatever. But I I also realize that um, we're in this unfortunate situation where we could at very short notice be required to hold um, hybrid meetings. And so we're just sort of forced into this by the state. And um, so the rest of the board realizes too, we have to hold yeah. meetings in the district. Yeah. We can't be outside of our, of our so I, I think there's not, you know, I, 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 I go along with this and with the same concerns Jamie does, but I think it's, it's the best solution given what we have. Bob? If I can help put your guys' mind just a little bit, the, the, um, the assuming the equipment doesn't, you know, blow up, the, the equipment is at least semi-portable and could be moved to a new location. Of course, if we're there for five to seven years, we'll probably want to get new stuff anyway. Um, so really, you know, we're we're looking at some of the light remodeling and re excuse me, refreshing, which if we ever did decide to to um, uh, dispose of the building uh, would probably help in its um, the disposal. So 
I, I okay. agree with you. It's it's not great, but I'm going to make some lemonade here if we can. <laughs> so, uh, All right. Well, that, that sounds good. Um, can I go out to the public and see if we have any um, comments from our two attendees? I don't see any. Um, so coming back to the board, um, we have a recommendation from uh, the staff to direct the district manager to move forward with preparing the Johnson Building, soon to be renamed, for hybrid in-person meetings of the board. Anybody like to make a motion? I'll make that motion. Okay. I will second that motion. Okay. Thank Go you. Any more, any other comments on the motion? If not, Holly, would you take a roll call vote, please? My mute off. I apologize. Right. President Mayhood. Aye. Vice President Henry. Yes. Director Ackman. Yes. Director Fulz. Yes. Director Smalley. Yes. Okay. Uh, the motion passes unanimously. Um, so we now move on to new business. Uh, the first item is the CSDA 2021 bylaws uh, vote. And, you know, um, there's a recommendation that the board uh, review and consider the updates to the 2021 CSDA bylaws and direct the district secretary to enter a vote yes uh, or no to the updates. Uh, the item speaks for itself. I don't have a lot of experience or background on this item. Um, I know uh, we received a, uh, a clarification from one of the directors on some of this. Um, I'll ask district council to, to step in and, and help me kind of stumble through this. If you would, Gina. Uh, I can do my best. Um, I, I'll fully admit I don't have much insight into CSDA's bylaw process either, except I can tell from reviewing the proposed bylaws that uh, members of which the district is one do have the right to vote on their approval. And I presume that's why the district's being asked to do this. Um, you know, I, I briefly skim the bylaws themselves. I don't know much about their process that went into this. I can only guess that they are doing, you know, their council is doing what it, they feel they need to do in order to make the bylaws consistent with the latest kind of standard models and precedents for this type of a nonprofit membership organization. But I, I don't have much more insight than that into the reason for the, the particular changes. Okay. Um, so are there any... Uh, comments or questions about this from members of the board. We have a, a recommendation from the staff to direct the secretary to enter a vote of yes or no to the updates, additions, and improvements in the 2021 CSDA bylaws. Bob. So there are, in these kinds of situations, there are a couple of things that I tend to look at fairly closely. And uh, unfortunately, these bylaws uh, kind of hit on those for me. Um, and that is the acceptance of members and the removal of members using what I would call fairly uh, opaque um, and not completely well-defined uh, criteria. Um, and it's for that reason that I, I, I will be voting no on this. Um, but I, I certainly understand that, that this is not a, a huge thing for um, us as a board. But, but it, I get concerned about what I see as a um, increasing trend in our country towards mechanisms around censorship and uh, dissenting views and that sort of thing. And I, I just can't support things that, that have the hints of that kind of thing coming down the road. Okay. Um, any other questions or comments from members of the board? Okay, then I'll ask uh, 
the members of the public to comment on this? Um, I guess then, uh, seeing them, then I guess I would just move um, that we direct the district secretary to enter a vote of yes to the updates, additions, and improvements in the 2021 CSDA bylaws. Is there a second? I'll second it. Okay. Holly, would you go ahead and take a um, roll call vote, please? President Mayhood? Aye. Vice President Henry? Yes. Director Ackman? Yes. Director Foles? No. Director Smalley? No. Okay. The motion passes. Um, next uh, item is the Quail Hollow Pipeline Construction Award of Contract. Yes, and I'll ask the district engineer to present this uh, item to the board. Thank you, Rick. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Bit of background. This is the Quail Hollow Road portion of our capital improvement program, looking at approximately a mile and a third worth of new 12 inch pipe. I was very pleased to see that we got 13 proposals, 13 bids, ranging from 2.4 million up to 4.5 million on this project. And having reviewed the bids with staff and with Director Smalley, as well as running these by the engineering committee, staff are recommending award to Granite Rock they were the low bid, and the bid amount is $2,387,000 even. I'm happy to take any questions or address any comments. Um, Mark, would you like to, as, as uh, chair of the engineering committee, to comment on this? Certainly. Um, engineering committee uh, discussed this at our meeting earlier this week. Uh, we concurred with staff's recommendation on Granite Rock. Um, being awarded this contract. Uh, Granite Rock is a well-recognized firm in the uh, general Northern California area. Uh, we question Josh as to why Granite Rock did uh, so well to be the winning bidder on this, and he indicated that he had reached out to them saying that they were high on quite a number of their other ones, uh, to the district, and they needed to sharpen their pencil and come back with something better. Uh, so uh, with that in mind, I did have a one follow-up question, Josh, that we had talked about briefly at the engineering committee meeting that I just wanted to resolve, and it was regarding the transite pipe and how they plan to cover that, to make sure that, yes, that is included in their costs. They have assured me that addressing the transite pipe is included in their costs. There was a phone call. I have an email out to follow up and get more detail as to exactly how. My assumption is they'll be bringing in a specialized subconsultant to handle it. Okay. Okay. I'm good with good with that then. Um, two other things I'd like to point out to the uh, board and the public. Um, Josh did some this had some discussions and negotiations with the county on the road resurfacing portions of this, which ultimately reduces the district's overall cost for the project, since the county is going to be doing work um, within Quail Hollow to resurface it. Um, we're able to offset some of our costs by having county involvement in that. Uh, the second one is uh, there's a 120-day lead time for materials on this. Um, in my mind, that's part of the supply chain issues that we've been hearing about for the last um, 18 months regarding COVID impacts to industries in general. So, uh, and that's just what we have to do at this point. So, that's all. Okay. Uh, Jamie, did you have any comments? No, I mean, uh, you know, I'm I'm glad to see this moving forward. Um, you know, I, I don't have any specific comments about the contract. Post. Okay, Bob. 
We had two questions. First of all, let me say woohoo. <laughs> We're very happy to see this uh, going. And I have to admit, my jaw hit the floor when I when I saw Granite Rock as the uh, as the uh, lead on that. So that's that's really good. They're a fantastic company. Um, first question has to do with um, uh, people that live on the road that are not currently uh, customers of the district. Are we um, planning on reaching out to them to have them become customers of the district? We have reached out to those uh, earlier on in the very, very beginning design phase with no response. Um, we will reach out again, though. We have plenty of time with the procurement of materials that we can reach out again uh, to. Um, I'm surprised that we didn't hear back because a couple of them have inquired in the past. Um, mm -hmm. so, uh, we will reach out again. And were we doing anything like waiving uh, one of the fees or something like that? I we were, wa we were waiving uh, install uh, the care kind of was to, to waive the installation cost, not the connection fee, and we could offer terms on the connection fee. Yeah, or maybe maybe a discount if the pipes, you know, if the trenches open or something. Um, the second uh, question was. Um, what was the original budget in the uh, 15 million COP that we put together back in 2019, I believe it was, do you recall? Did we come in at or un under budget basically is what I'm, or over? We got something under, but I, I'll have to look at budget, Bob, and answer that question. Please. Yeah, if you could just send me a note, I'm, I'm curious about. I'm sure I have it somewhere, but I, I figured you guys probably had it at the top of your. Um, it's, top of your it's in our current budget, so it'll be an easy number to find. Yeah, that, that, that's the that's the one going back to 2015 because I remember that Quail Hollow number coming in at this uh, just a ginormous number that that I think really floored everybody at the time. And I I think I recall that this is much lower than that, but I I, I believe so as well. Yeah. Mark, Thank did you, you want to comment it's, on it's that? Great. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask whenever Rick gets that, if you could circulate it to the rest of the directors also. I, I will handle that as an uh, informational request and all board. Okay, members. thank yeah. you. Much easier after the meeting than before the meeting. Sure. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, and uh, <laughs> great, great work, guys. This is exciting stuff. Yeah, on, the line, on the line. I just want to say, uh, you know, this project for the newer board members, it removes a huge restriction between our, well, or our uh, Olympia well fields, our south system, and the north system. And it also uh, allows a, a huge restriction removal for flowing water out to the Lampico inner tie, which was part of some issues going forward with the uh, consolidation of Lampico. This will now give us a backbone main line from Scotts Valley, Boulder Creek, 10 and 12 inches. Huge restriction for surface water on conjunctive use to move south well water to move north, and possibly it'll remove a very problematic transite pipeline cross country in the sand hills that we nicknamed the desert line um, <laughs> that uh, has been a, a thorn in our side for many years. So uh, this is a great, great stuff. All the way around. Great, great stuff. Okay. Any other comments from the board? If not, I'll go out. Oh, well, go ahead, Lois. I was just going to say, as a member of the engineering committee, we talked about this uh, quite a bit at the last meeting, and I totally go along with, with supporting Granite Rock to do this. Okay. Are there any comments uh, from members of the public? Seeing none, hearing none, I'll come back to the board. Um, I think Gina was going to provide us with a uh, recommendation that we, uh, we in, in the language that she wants it to, to be uh, in terms of how we should be dealing with contracts. So Gina, would you like to do that? Yeah, thank you, Chairman Hood. Um, I, I do want to reach some sort of standard language for approving contracts and especially large contracts like this one as we get into these these big projects. Um, so I'm just going to read the language of the proposed motion and then I'm going to work on getting this into future board packets. Uh, my proposal would be a motion to award the construction contract.
for the Quail Hollow Pipeline Replacement Construction Project to the Granite Rock Company based on its bid in the amount of $2,387,000 and authorize the district manager to execute such contract on behalf of the district. Okay. Would anybody like to move that? I'll make that motion. Second. Second. All right. Uh, Holly, would any other comments or questions before I go to a roll call vote? Holly? President Mayhood? Aye. Vice President Henry? Yes. Director Ackman? Yes. Director Fultz? Yes. Director Smalley? Yes. The motion passes unanimously. With that, we'll go to um, the item C, which is the Quail Hollow Pipeline Construction Management Award of Contract. And I'll ask the district engineer to present that to the board as well, please. Thank you, Rick. This is the construction management proposal or bidding for Quail Hollow for the construction pipeline, for the construction of the pipeline, which we just discussed. So this is, as usual, in addition to the construction cost. We had four bidders. Bids ranged from a low of $163,500 to a high of $305,600. So quite a spread. I'm, staff reviewed these. We determined that the low bid from MME Civil and Structural was a good solid bid. It addressed everything in the RFP. We reviewed the bids with Director Smalley and with the Engineering Committee and staff are recommending that construction management work for the Quail Hollow project be awarded to MME Civil and Structural. I will happily take questions or comments. Okay. Let's start with uh, Mark as the chair of the engineering committee. Okay, uh, the engineering committee reviewed this earlier this week, but we discussed it. We agreed with staff's recommendation that MME uh, Civil and Structural he awarded the contract. Um, I'd like to point out that we did get uh, three other bids from firms that um, haven't done work for the district in the past, but I consider that to be a good thing. Um, Josh has done outreach to attract other uh, qualified firms to become interested in doing work for the district. Just so happens that uh, one of our existing uh, prior firms that's done good work for the district has the low bid and good for MME. So that's it. Okay. Lois, you're also on the committee. Did you want to make a comment? Well, I believe MME is a great firm and I, I will support what um, Mark has said and, and Josh has said that we go ahead and award it to MME. Uh, any other comments from members of the board or questions? Bob? Um, oh, go ahead, Jane. I, go ahead, thank Jane. You, thank you. Um, I was just going to ask, um, this: the kind of activities that MME is going to be responsible for, um, do you envision uh, that the when you are able to hire the project manager, that they will be taking some role in contracts like this as well? I'm just curious. No, I do not, Jamie. Did you hear me? Yes, I, I heard you. I'm so I'm just um you it's a specialized type of project management of, of, of the projects, and it's a project, the project manager for construction project will be on that project mostly in its entirety and won't would not have time to do you know the, our, the project manager that we're looking for is going to have multiple tasks and multiple projects within the operations and in, in internal operations of the departments of the district i see so you're saying that the, the tasks associated with the project management for this pipeline replacement project are going to require the full-time oversight of and which is, okay got it thank well, you and i think it's it's a more technical thing as opposed to a you know project management what we're thinking about internally got so, it yeah thanks thanks Gail uh Bob no I 
wanted to reinforce the, um, you know, kudos to Josh for getting multiple bidders on this. Um, definitely like to see that going forward as well, because that's how we're going to get our uh, cost down. I just remember, you know, going back to the original swim tank bid where it came in, you know, three times almost what the uh, engineering estimate was because we had just one bidder and it really put us over over a barrel there. So, um, yeah, this is great stuff. Let's let's do it. Okay. Are there any comments uh, from the public? Okay, hearing none, seeing none. Uh, Gina, would you like to state this recommendation the way you would like it done? Thank you, uh, Chair Mayhood. Uh, I would, have, would like to propose a motion to authorize the district manager to negotiate and execute a contract on behalf of the district with MME Civil and Structural Engineering for construction management activities for the Quail Hollow pipeline replacement in an amount not to exceed $163,554. Can I make the motion? Yes, you may. Uh, what she said. Okay. I'll second that. All right. Holly, would you take a roll call vote, please? President Mayhood? Aye. Vice President Henry? Yes. Director Ackman? Yes. Director Pulse? Yes. Director Smalley? Yes. Okay. The motion passes unanimously. All right, we now move on to item 13, which is uh, the consent agenda. Um, are there any items that members of the board or members of the public, let me first ask members of the board if there's anything that they would like moved to a regular agenda. No, how about the members of the public? Okay, uh, then we also have a district reports and I think Rick I'll start with you because I think you said you were going to have a few questions answered publicly is that correct yes um, thank you we received several questions uh, regarding issues and reports and normally I would probably send out a response to all members but seeing these items were on the agenda it's a little more problematic to inform board members so for one for the appropriate staff member on the appropriate report I forward those um, uh, questions to the staff member. They will answer those when you get to their report. But a couple that have came up in, in, in under my response is where we are with Big Basin Water. Um, as you know, Big Basin Water had a um, main break on their largest transmission main that put pretty much 100% of their customer base out of water. Um, 24 hours into the outage, uh, the representatives of Big Basin Water contacted me uh, asking for help in uh, facilitating repairs. Um, I sent um, a repair crew up to facilitate, make repairs. Um, we made the repairs. Um, as of this morning, uh, their system has been repressurized. Um, our staff are assisting in bacteriological sampling to help get their water potable again. Uh, Big Basin Water also requested the bulk filling station uh, to be reinstalled that we had out during CZU fire at the operations building, which we put that back in service and will keep in service until their water is potable. It's getting a lot of use. Um, we do plan, uh, we did cut a service order and we are charging all time materials uh, and sampling. Uh, we will charge uh, Big Basin Water, invoice them for 100% of that work. Um, so uh, I wanted to give you a quick update on that. And uh, when we get to the engineering report, I will ask Josh to uh, give an update on the Bear Creek Road. There's been several questions. Uh, regarding Bear Creek Road, and Josh will also give an update on uh, Huckleberry Island, um, the 12 inch. Um, so, with that, I think the first uh, staff report is engineering, and uh, I'll ask Josh to answer the questions that I forward in regards to engineering and projects. All right. Uh, thank you, Rick. On to engineering. Uh, Huckleberry Island. Great, I just lost 
my window. Bear with me just a moment while I get this back. I apologize for this, folks. I just want to note that I saw Supervisor Henry's hand up, and I don't know if it was related to Rick. Maybe Rick could answer her question while uh, Josh is getting his notes. Go ahead, Lois. No, it had nothing to do with Rick. I, I wanted to comment on uh, the engineering, but he hasn't had a chance to talk yet. Okay. I'm really embarrassed here. Do you want us like, to move on to the next report? If, come back if you that? if you would, please. Okay, well, generally, we don't go through each one of these. We just see if board members or members of the public have a question. Well, um, I can ask them a question. So now. Why don't, Lois, go ahead and why don't That'd you? That'd be great. Okay. I'm concerned about Huckleberry Island because it looks like we're going to have heavy rain. Uh, this weekend, and if that caves in, we're going to have a big mess. A couple entirely. Times. Go ahead, Josh. I was going to say, do you want me to handle that? Entirely yeah, understandable, go ahead. Go ahead. Lois. I do have some more I can add to that. Fair enough. Entirely understandable concern. I will say that when our our field staff went out and took care of the failure, they did quite a good job of securing the pipeline. So I am confident, having been out there a couple of times now, that even if there is heavy rain and the heavy rain results in much greater slide than is normal, that the pipeline will still hold up. And if I can add to that, Lois, if we do get heavy rain, that'll mean our surface source at Foreman Creek will start to come up and we will be able to get that source back online and get another water source in Boulder Creek. We're offline right now, but with heavy rainfall, we should get flow within a day or two to uh, put that back in service. So we have contingency plans. Well, thank you. That's all good news. Uh, would there also be a contingency plan to uh, install something uh, temporary if necessary? That is, do we have the materials uh, to be able to do something with that um, pipe bid washout? We're working in that direction, um, Bob. Um, we're getting the survey done next week. As soon as we have the pipe route, the new pipe route uh, located out, District staff will move in and cut the isolation valves so we can do a very quick bypass. Um, you know, we're in a little better shape than we were. We know more about it. We know we've done a lot of locating. James has had his crews out there potholing, finding the main to make sure it's where it's supposed to. Survey, I do believe, uh, and uh, Josh, if you're ready, you can take over. It should uh, be out there in the next week. And once we know survey and where the easements are, um, or the, the already existing easements, uh, then James's crew will go in, cut in isolation valves, and then that'll be a, a, a quick bypass. But again, once again, once we start getting some rainfall and those Foreman Creek comes up, you know, there'll be a big sigh of relief because we'll have a feed in Boulder Creek. Well, indeed. And, and with that, we are prepared, Bob. We do have materials and we are prepared. We will be able to do a bypass if we need. Okay, great. Thank you. I have gotten myself back to yellow, so I'm, I'm happy to take questions. Carry on. Josh, could you give an update on Bear Creek Road, please? We had a question. On Certainly. That. I, the Bear Creek Road slip out where the county has decided they're holding off their work until springtime. In digging through our historical files, I was able to find an as-built drawing showing that in that area, We've actually already moved the transit line from the eastbound lane across into the westbound lane, which is the uphill side of the road. 
And in addition to that, in perhaps an excess of caution, but I'm an engineer, I'm good with excess of caution. We have also installed a two inch bypass that is currently operational. So it appears that road slid out in 82 and we've already done a ductile iron bypass. And once we saw the plans, it jogged memories and yes, we did do that work. Um, so we'll be monitoring closely and working with the county um, on their project because we have to protect that main line now from whatever the county is going to do with their tie back system, et cetera. Bob? Yeah, in general, I just am I'm very concerned about any of our uh, pipe crossing culverts um, uh, for reasons that I think we uh, understand. Indeed. Any other comments on that? All right. Um, are there any other questions or comments about um, department status reports? Or is, go ahead, Mark. Yes. Um, on the uh, finance and budget report on page, uh, PDF page uh, 114, it shows that we're 6% uh, uh, below baseline for uh, water, what, our cumulative analysis uh, year to date. How does that compare to our goal for what we're asking for water conservation of thought we were asking for between 10 and 15 percent? Um, I wouldn't have that answer right now, but I can look into that how the baseline compares to the the what we're asking. Okay. Yeah, and, um, and, and and Director Smalley, I'd like to add that I think we were asking for only outdoor conservation, which is difficult for us to to determine um, from our indoor and outdoor. So Kendra and I can work on that for you, though. But but we did state a percentage goal reduction, and, and I don't believe that we can ask for ten percent on your outdoor use only. I'm not sure. So I thought it was at right. at least a ten percent overall. That we were asking and i don't know if we're comparing that to a uh, high water usage year which is mm -hmm. not part of this three-year span or how that so just some clarification on that okay uh, okay I, I i think mark i think you raise a very good point because for me the messaging around this has always been a little um, a little fuzzy in terms of what we're telling the community. Yeah. You know, our, our current our current baseline actually goes back to 2015 on the ordinance, and we're we're already meeting a 20 20 percent reduction based on that baseline since that was never reset between then and okay. now. I that, think we're I, yeah I think we're down another. That makes sense. I think we're down another eight percent this month. The cumulative yeah. part is different from the, the current month, which would take us down pretty close to a stage three reduction uh, yeah. had we wanted to go to that level uh, relative to the 2015 baseline. So yeah. when this is all said and done, and hopefully this rain is a harbinger of a decent rain year, maybe not an overly, because I don't necessarily want to go overly due to the dangers of debris flow still. Um, maybe we can reset our baseline so that when we do get into another drought situation, we don't have this sort of fuzziness around our messaging. Jamie? Just a, just a quick FYI to that. It's a 2013 baseline on that, not 15. Uh, the ordinance um, uh, was, was reset. I'm referring to the ordinance, James. The ordinance was reset in 2015. You're correct that I believe it uses a time Why? before that. Yeah. Right, but the ordinance itself was in 2015, and that's the one that we need to update. Yeah. Jamie? I was I, just going to ask a question about um, water reduction totals. I mean, I know there's a, there's a difference between the way that we are messaging it to, um, you know, our, our customers and, and what the, the state 
is actually expecting of water districts typically, and, and Rick, maybe correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, but as I recall it, um, usually the state has a sort of goal for each, you know, um, region in total reduction. And what they're really looking for is the water provider to, to hit that goal if some customers are over and some customers are under, as long as they're averaging that reduction in usage across their customer base, they're considered to be within compliance. Is that is that accurate, Rick? You know, I, I, I do believe you're correct. In California, I don't believe it's even close to that. However, what's difficult with our customer base, our customer base indoor water use is also, is already considerably low. And it's difficult to ask people to reduce, you know, their overall water use, and you get a lot of pushback. And and I have to, you know, I agree with uh, Director Fultz. Our message is kind of fuzzy because we're tailoring it just to the outdoor use because, of, and and that's difficult, and it's hard to put numbers on that. But it's easy for our customers to to say, yeah, I can reduce my outdoor use, and look at that where it's not easy for them to do their indoor use. So I think we get a better response by just looking at outdoor water use, you know, the washing their car, the watering and so forth. People can can understand that. But you start talking about overall, just across the board, you know, reduce your water use. People get, get frustrated, they push back. They, I'm already doing everything I can. I've, I've done rebates, I've done this. And so we try to say, well, you know, center on your outdoor use and it's a you know I, I understand bob's concerns the message is a little fuzzy you don't know how do you calculate that and but it seems to be working i guess my point any other comments or questions on that particular topic okay if not is, is there anything else, Rick, that you wanted one of the staff to report on in response to a question? Uh, I think James had uh, some answers to uh, questions and Carly had uh, a couple quick answers I'd like uh, uh, to, to provide answers to. James, you wanna? Yeah, I'd like Bob to ask the question to be on record. Sure, hang on one sec. This, um, this new process, we probably need to talk about formalizing this new process a little bit. Yeah, it was about the, it was about the inner ties. It, yeah, it is, it is a little um, uh, awkward, I think, is the case. But yes, it was a question about the water flows over the um, inner ties we had from south to north and north to Felton. But um, uh, I'm not sure that I've seen those before. So I'm just curious. Right. So um, I did fail to report my report that we did have only two, one of our wells go down during the month. Oh. Um, so that is why we started bringing water back from the south system to the north system. And at that same time, we were in a, um, in a hot time of the month. And water usage went up significantly, especially in Felton. And at the same time, Fall Creek dropped off flow a little bit, so we had lower flow to stay in compliance. Um, so that is so the only two is the reason we were bringing water from south to north to supplement that water, and then at that same time, we started having to bring water from the north to the Felton through IT six because of Fall Creek flow dropping off to um, make up for demand. Great, thank you. Welcome. And I think I failed to call on Cynthia earlier. I think I suspect that she had a question maybe about an, an earlier topic. Cynthia, go ahead and, and weigh in. Can we have uh, Cynthia be allowed to talk, please? CTV folk. Well, until CTV folk uh, get to Cynthia, let's go ahead and uh, have Carly uh, go to the question. Oh, oh, there we is. She can speak now. Go ahead, Cynthia. Can you hear me now? We sure can. Okay. Um, my suggestion was that you message to clients by telling us the gallons per person per day that should be our target. 
and let us decide whether that is going to be by reducing internal um, in household use in order to water the garden or cut down on watering outside. But it's much easier for people to look at their bills and figure out gallons per person per day than to do all these other, you know, general instructions, right? And the other thing is, what percentage are we using by leakage? You know, if I'm using 50 gallons per person per day, uh, the district's usage is going to be some percentage more than that, right? Because, because of the leakage. Did you want to answer that, Rick? Um, well, you know, we do have a, a high unaccounted for water loss that we are working on. Um, we are collecting information. We just discussed leak detection at the engineering committee. Most likely we're moving ahead uh, instead of every three years on doing leak detection to do it every other year. Uh, and we're going to uh, collect more information so we can assign numbers to you know, how much we produce and how much we sell and, and how much we lose. We need a little more information, um, but I don't have exactly, you know, I can give you a gallonage number, but that number also contains processed water, you know, water what we use to uh, flush with, water that we use to make water and treat water, um, you know, and, and mainline flushing. So, and it also has what water was used in the CZU fire. So it's a big number. Um, it's a tough question to answer at this time, Cynthia. Bob? But I think Cynthia is um, just spot on with, with her suggestion here, and this goes back to data and, um, and managing by, by data. Um, you, you know, we first need to get to how we're going to calculate that uh, water use per day. I have my way. Uh, but I don't know that it is universally agreed upon in, inside of the district. And my way is very simple. I take an average of, I think it was December, January, February. Um, and I, because that's the, you know, months people aren't using uh, outdoor water as much, typically. And I divide by 22,000, 23,000, and 24,000 pots. And that gives you a gallon per day. And that's anywhere from 38 to 42. We're almost 20% below the state ultimate goal already for indoor water usage. So when Rick talks about pushing on, on people, absolutely, we should not be pushing on people on their indoor water use. But by providing that average benchmark, agreeing on what that's going to be and, and doing as Cynthia suggests, that would give people information upon which, particularly those with badger meter, to be able to monitor and manage their water use in a much better way. So I, I really wish that uh, and hope that we can get to that kind of clarity um, about uh, this, this data aspect. Lois? Seems to me that we need more badger meters because I can do eye on water and look and it tells me that I don't have any leaks. It tells me how much I'm using. And it's a great tool. And everyone I know who has a badger meter really loves that meter. And that would, I think, answer a lot of questions about where the water's going uh, because there is a big number out there that could possibly be from leaks. I don't remember what they are. Uh, but I think we need to move ahead with these badger meters. Well, we are. I mean, we are, and we have a budgeted, and we have a, a, a program of how many we're changing, and, and we are moving in that direction. And we're also looking for grant money, hopefully, that could help the district move, a, move ahead with that as well as part of the drought. Bob? Uh, sorry, I forgot to mention this too. Uh, Cynthia, your other question about the, uh, the leaks and that sort of thing. So the district recently did a leak detection process, which uh, ultimately stopped um, 
effectively 4% of our annualized production uh, from going into the ground. That is a significant amount of, my, uh, of uh, money and water. And also I think contributed to the kind of um, uh, conservation that not only uh, we ask the customers to do, but the district needs to do as well. And so uh, to hear that we're gonna move that towards a every other year, and I would even support every year if the numbers uh, you know, indicate that we should be, um, the ROI on this leak detection is, is enormous, it's off the charts. Uh, Rick, did you want to respond to that? I, I can agree with with all, everything that's being said here, and and we need to develop those numbers. And I don't want to sound like a broken record, but that's one of the areas the, the project manager will work on with the director of operations, getting all those numbers and information and putting together that exact type of report that Bob's talking about. I totally agree. It's just we've got to get the staff time the numbers and get it out into the report. I agree. And we thought, you know, by moving ahead, we had a, a lengthy discussion at the engineering committee meeting. Um, we did leak detection last year. Um, so we have this year to kind of put things together and then next year we will do. But what, you know, we discussed uh, at engineering committee was that, you know, we need to know how much water we're producing, how much water we're selling, and then start looking at leak detection and then put that against the reduction. And then each year, you know, we do leak detection. If our total water loss starts going down, continuing to go down, we continue to do leak detection. If we hit a flat line to where it's not uh, having an impact anymore, we cut back and then maybe we go, or maybe we increase to every year or we decrease to every other year. As James stated in engineering, uh, AWWA recommended leak detection, I think is every three years, James? Three to five. Every three to five. Grant, you we're an older system. We we are doing every three years. Older systems have higher unaccounted for water loss. You know, another thing that we're doing, removing the redwood tanks. We have an aggressive capital improvement program that's addressing water loss through our aging facilities. Um, a lot's going on and the meters are a great thing. And with that, if Regina yells at us for getting off topic, um, I'll uh, shut up. Okay, Mark? Um, my comment to Rick's uh, conclusion was off topic. It was regarding this leak detection that we discussed at the engineering committee meeting, which I guess isn't, isn't on the agenda, so. Okay. Uh, Cynthia, you have a question? Another question or comment? Yes, I just wanted to mention that um, friends of San Lorenzo Valley Water would like to um, let, well, educate people about using their bills to calculate their gallons per person per day. And I was told that certain routes um, have badger meters, but it's not easy to see that for the normal customer on their invoice. So if there's a way that each invoice could note for the client, whether they are on the Badger meters and, um, you know, because some people maybe received the notification a few years ago and they don't know whether they're actually able to use ion water or not. Thank you. Just to respond to Cynthia, we do try to make extensive customer contact every time we change over to a Badger Ion Water. We send out information, we handheld, handheld people through the uh, signing up online and so forth, and we really push them to sign up for Ion Water. Uh, Kendra, do you wanna add anything to that? Uh, yeah, every time we uh, update a Badger meter in our system, we do send out an uh, email with uh, sign-up instructions, or if they don't have an email on file, we'll mail them the instructions. Um, but yeah, right now, there's no easy way to distinguish on the bills uh, whether they have a Badger meter or not. Um, but we do try to send out the sign-up information each time a meter is changed. A yeah, quick question. That so, what about when a house sells or an account changes? Do we send it out again to the new owners or new account holders? Yeah. 
Yeah, so when there's a new sign up, um, they'll get like what's called a welcome packet. And if they are on a badger meter, we include the sign up information in that as well. Excellent. I learned something too. Great question. Okay. Uh, okay, are there any other questions or or responses real quick? Carly had, uh, there was a couple of good questions regarding uh, Olympia Watershed Project and Carly's going to answer those. Go ahead, Carly. All right. Uh, we did receive a couple of questions from direct, Director Fultz. Um, we had a question about a Olympia project. So right now we're working with PG&E uh, with the potential mitigation project where our pretty much our compensation for letting them use our land for mitigation would be to clear about five or six acres of French broom from the property and other invasives. Uh, right now, it looks like we're pretty much waiting on um, an agreement to be approved by legal counsel, and it sounds like PG&E is ready to move on it. We've had the regional board, um, CDFW, and the Federal Fish and Wildlife sign off on this mitigation project, which is really great. Um, it's a it's a benefit beyond just the broom removal. The mitigation itself would be improving the riparian habitat on our Olympia property. So it's a pretty exciting project. Um, the other questions involved um, conjunctive use. The grant for conjunctive use has ended and ended in June. Um, however, with the public concern we received on the ISMND, we're we're actually looking into potentially doing um, more work on that project. So the question I think involved, I don't know if Bob wants to um, reiterate his question just for the public or. Go ahead, Bob. Um, well, yes, I mean, I'm, I'm just very um, anxious to get to the situation where um, we have everything except for the state uh, water board approval to be able to take water from any source, deliver to any destination for any reason, not just emergencies. That will allow us to manage our water district as a unified whole, as opposed to the sort of uh, three separate uh, systems that we, we kind of have now. Right, yeah, so that will be the ultimate goal of our conjunctive use plan. Um, right now, with the the public concern, we are trying to address all the comments we received on the ISMND, and that will be coming to the board probably in November. Um, but once we do move through that and the petitions and all the other uh, regulatory agency permitting, we will be able to use those energies outside of emergencies as well. And that's the goal, the ultimate goal of the conjunctive use plan. Sorry, so I'm, I'm, I'm still not quite ready, but close. Um, so uh, this process here for the grant, that basically takes care of the CEQA portion of the process. Is that what I understand? Um, well, it took, part, it took care of part of it, right? <laughs> I guess is how it should be stated. So the grant did end in June. Unfortunately, the CEQA process we went through, which was an ISMND, doesn't seem like it's going to be sufficient. Um, to the district standards. So we're hoping to go back in and reconfigure what we're going to address in the total conjunctive use plan, as well as what we have to go through with the CEQA process. And yeah. I, I'm not sure what I can add on that, but other than we'll be bringing it to the board in November with full detail. And, and yeah. that the public, let, com let, the public let, comment um, was um, from Santa Cruz, right? The Santa Cruz. I uh, water that water. update there. Yeah, yeah, I think I think we should leave it there and just just guarantee we guarantee that something will come back at the November meeting, whether you know whether it's finished or not. That that you guys will bring an agendized item um, so that we can have a full on discussion of, of this. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And I think that's all we have, uh, Chair, for reports. I apologize; it's a little rough getting these questions out. We're still trying to iron out this process to get questions and answers to board members. I mean, we're getting a lot of good questions and uh, I think it's important that the full board hears the answers. And but with Brown Act issues and things on the agenda, it's a little difficult to send out emails, as you know, without posting it to the agenda. So uh, we're still working this out. It's a little rough, but thank you for your patience. Okay. Bob, did you? Yes, yes, just one more question. This would be for Kendra on the finance report. 
I just want to make sure I'm reading the report correctly on the past due accounts. If we exclude the um, uh, current bills, which are the less than 30 days, uh, did our um, past due go up or down between July and, and August? Uh, it went up, but next month on the September report, we should see a reduction because of the uh, accounts that we sent to the property tax roll. Um, so we will start to see a reduction from that. Um, but it went up uh, a little bit from the uh, July to August. Yeah, I, I, I tend to exclude the 30 day one because it's it's still current. It's not past due. So, you know. Right, right. And I and I can modify that report to exclude that because I mean, you're right The it's a past due analysis. So we don't really need the current 30 days. On well, there. I, I, I like to see the numbers, but we don't need to include it in the, right. in the calc. Yeah. OK, yeah. great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. That's great. Mm -hmm. OK. Are there any other uh, questions from the board on department status reports? Um, or how about from the public? And then finally, we have the committee reports. Anything there from the board, from the public? Um, then uh, I think we're pretty much at the end of our meeting. and. If I don't hear any objections, I will say that we are adjourned for the evening. Good night, everyone. All right. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. At 739 for adjournment. Thank you.